Is this something? As a physical anthropologist, I've heard that question more than any other. <laughs> Working on an archaeological dig or in my teaching lab, somebody would yell, hey, doc, is this something? <laughs> and I'd go over and I'd say, hmm, looks like a piece of bone, or it's a flake off a stone tool, or no, you got yourself a rock, Charlie Brown. <laughs> Is this something sounds like an interest, uh, easy question, but what I wanted my students to truly understand was that anthropology is not about things. It's not about finding things even. It's about humankind. And ancient artifacts and skeletons are just the tools that we used to reconstruct the living, breathing, human beings' lives and the societies that they created. In physical anthropology, we are dealing with a bit of a paradox and trying to explain it. We humans are all the same. We are all one species, homo sapiens sapiens, and yet we're all different. And that variation is a good thing, because without it, we wouldn't be having this conversation today. Evolution would not take place. Biological differences have great relevance today. Physical anthropologists long ago determined that no group of people, no race, is innately superior or inferior to any other. This scientific fact should dispel myths that have been used to justify everything from racism, segregation, homophobia, sexism, misogyny, even genocide. Imagine being a black woman, going into a doctor's office and hearing the words, you can't sit in that waiting room, girl. Get over there behind that wall. It's a vivid memory because my mom refused to sit in the whites only section. And when my mom was called back, she was addressed as Mrs. Sanford. When a woman was color, of color was called back, she was addressed by her first name, Lurleen, and called back only after all of the white people had been seen. It was anthropology that inspired my mother's activism in the segregated South of the 1960s. She did a lot of very brave things. She became involved in civil rights to support four students who were integrating this lo local state college in our little town in Arkansas. These students were allowed to go to class. They just couldn't eat because the cafeteria was still segregated and all the restaurants in town were segregated. So she began interracial meetings. And one night, I was spying on such a meeting in, one of, in our home. I was about six. And I caught the eye of a gentleman in the room, and he motioned me to him, and he offered me a handshake and a stick of gum. And as I looked at his palms, I saw that the, fronts of it, the palms of his hand were light tan, but the backs of his hands were darker colored, the same color as his face and neck. His was the first black hand that I had ever touched. My mentor, uh, and author, physical anthropologist Alice Bruce, has said, racial differences need not be thought of as something puzzling or uncomfortable things about strangers. They can also be interesting things about our friends. And I was just busy making friends. I did not know at first that this activism was so dangerous. I didn't know uh, that the White Citizens Council had expressed their opposition to my mom's meetings. In 1963, in April, Dr. King came to Little Rock, Arkansas to uh, deliver a sermon. He had just been released from the Birmingham jail, so mom drove us to hear him speak. The pews were packed by the time we got there, so mom and my sisters her students, we, set, we stood at the back of the church. 
And people just kept coming in in droves. So I just went over and started opening the door for people. And from the expression on people's faces, I was the last thing they were expecting to see, a little nine-year-old white girl opening the door for people. Dr. King's sermon, A Knock at Midnight, was based on a parable. A friend knocks on a neighbor's door at midnight asking for three loaves of bread. Midnight was a metaphor for the dark areas in society and in our lives that are in need of the light of social justice. The loaves of bread stand for our hungering for faith, hope, and love. Dr. King said events in the modern world made many feel like they don't belong, like they're little more than numbers. He said society has become oppressively impersonal. But it became intensely personal for me. On September the 15th, 1963, at 1022 in the morning, a box of dynamite exploded under the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham. Four little girls at that instant, ages 11 to 14, were killed as they were walking down the stairs into the basement. The day after, I saw their pictures on the front page of the newspaper. And I thought to myself, I was sitting in my very own Sunday school class at the exact time the bomb went off. I never had to be afraid of going to church. I identified with those little girls because they were different, and I had my own differences too. Unlike most Southern girls, little girls, I loved playing football and basketball. I didn't enjoy other things. I could have gone the rest of my life and lived happily ever after without hearing about dresses or high heels <laughs> or even thoughts of having babies someday. And society was quick to show me the error of my ways. One day, I was playing basketball in the gym with my dad at the local college. And some boys in the stand started to heckle me. Dad walked over to me, put his arm on my back, and he said, if you're going to play the game, you've got to learn to ignore the people in the stands. <laughs> ignore the people in the stands has become a guiding principle in my life that's helped me do a lot of the things that I have done. And my dad's still my hero. I ignored the people in the stands when I pursued anthropology, of all things, because it was illegal to teach evolution in, in Arkansas until 1967. <laughs> so my mom just got together a class, of anthropology class that met at our house <laughs> with the shades pulled you know, and the lights dimmed. And by the time I got to high school, I was already um, studying anthropology because I was auditing college classes. And by the time I got to college, I was determined that I was going to study anthropology. So every summer, I went on an archaeological dig. And in the summer of 1973, I got extremely lucky because I was able to work as a volunteer at the Center for American Archaeology in Campsville, Illinois, with the woman in the red bandana and one of my mentors, Dr. Jane Bikestra. That first evening in Jane's lab, she In Jane's osteology lab that first night, she held a skull and staring intently into its eye sockets. She described not some object, not some inanimate thing, but a person long ago deceased. And it was that night that I learned all of the things one can learn from the human skeleton age, sex, ancestry, even disease and nutritional patterns. And I knew at that very moment that I was going to study bones for a good bit of my life. But the midnight knocks of activism kept coming, as they do. My senior year, I drove to the Arkansas State Capitol to 
hear the ERA be debated and support the Equal Rights Amendment. The words equality or rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. That's the Equal Rights Amendment. It went down that day in Arkansas. It was defeated. Those simple words written by scholar, activist, Dr. Alice Paul, a suffragette, a pioneer, were defeated that day. Imagine what our society, our world would be like if we could just ratify the ERA and get it in the United States Constitution. So when it came to going to graduate school, I picked Colorado. And I have to say <laughs> that Boulder was the promised land compared to many um, places, including Arkadelphia, Arkansas, where I grew up. The degrees I earned at Colorado, my master's and my doctorate, made it possible for me to teach at college and to do my own research. And I focused largely on island and coastal populations. And that only has reinforced my environmental activism because I've learned that islands, like our beautiful home here on Whidbey, are among the most vulnerable of the ecosystems. As a new professor, though, another knock came in 1981 when I read with a horrible, horrific sense of foreboding a headline that read, Kaposi sarcoma and pneumocystis pneumonia among homosexual men, New York and California. I and many others rushed to volunteer. I worked the AIDS hotline and I heard many calls that went a lot like, hello, my name's Mike. I'm 18 years old. The doctor told me I have AIDS. I am going to die soon. My mother doesn't even know I'm gay. Can you help me? I heard Dr. Kim's phrase oppressively impersonal with every single hotline call. But 15 years later, my heart, my life would be cracked wide open again by the loudest and sweetest knock of all from my beloved Dr. Eileen Jackson. Eileen and I began circle training with Anne, Christ Anne Linnea and Christina Baldwin, who live here on Whidbey. And we learned from them of this wonderful island, Whidbey Island. And so we ask ourselves at that point, can we use this methodology, which is designed as a group process, can we use this methodology at the university of all places to foster difficult conversations about complex issues? That opportunity presented itself when I became an associate dean at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, charged with developing um, uh, the Race and Gender Institute, which was a series, of, a year-long series of events. The, this is described in Christina and Anne's book, The Circle Way. A series of events that was focused on issues of race and gender. The key event was presentation of Emily Mann's play or docudrama, Greensboro a Requiem, about the Greensboro Massacre, of which you may have heard in 1979, five union organizers were murdered at an anti klan rally in Greensboro. The opening night of that play, the healing began in Greensboro. Survivors of the Greensboro massacre sat next to faculty members, sat next to their children, sat next to policemen, sat next to their neighbors and friends, and the healing began right then. And it spread throughout the Greensboro community and ultimately has resulted in uh, a truth and reconciliation project modeled after the South African one. The knocks at midnight keep coming, as they do. Eileen and I join with our sisters and brothers in the LGBTQ community working for full equality, not just marriage equality, but an end to heterosexism. In July of 2009, we were married for the first time. At, thank you. At the UU congregation, Reverend Kit Ketchum presiding. 
We were legally married on December the 9th, 2003, the first day we were eligible to be married under Washington state law, thanks, I suspect, to many of you and the hard work of many. And we were married in the home of Greta Kammermeyer and Diane Divelbess, who have done so much for this community in terms of human rights. But this summer, Eileen and I will celebrate 20 years together as a loving, committed couple. Marriage matters. Marriage equality matters for the same reason that all movements toward equality matter. Because underlying all movements of equality is the acknowledgment of personhood. Anthropologist Robert Redfield wrote a famous essay in 1947, and he wrote the words, a person is myself in another form. I believe that when we truly embrace that idea of a person is myself in another form, that we will find that differences really are just interesting things about our friends. And we'll never allow others to be treated on the basis of, basis of differences in thing fashion, as Redfield put it, or as something less than human. So, in conclusion, <laughs> I believe that, of course, the knocks at midnight will continue. Um, I believe that other species, from dogs to dolphin, whales to wolves, have something to teach us about personhood. Certainly our closest living relatives, the chimpanzees and the other great apes. So Eileen and I are thankful that we've made Whidbey our home, where many of us acknowledge, even embrace the idea of personhood of all beings. But there's still much to do. Protecting and securing human rights is always going to be unfinished business. May we all continue to answer the knocks at midnight and feast together on the loaves of faith, hope, and love. Thank you.